this is available if you want it to go back and forth. Laser up top? Okay. Okay, good morning everyone. Can you hear me okay in the back? Good? All right. Well, my name, is, my name is Bob Cook. I'm a soybean entomologist stationed on campus here. I have research and extension responsibilities. And working in soybean, the main uh, critter that I work with is, is a soybean aphid. And Joe mentioned a little bit about the soybean aphid. I'm going to give you a bit more of an in-depth explanation of that pest, uh, where it came from, what it's doing, why we care about it, and then kind of wrap it up by making that connection back to buckthorn, which I think is the key reason all of you are here. So first off, soybean is an important agricultural product in Minnesota. Um, some data from 2016, you know, we're looking at three, what are we up to there, billion worth of uh, production value. And you can see that, oops, the bulk of Minnesota, you know, many of our counties are, are producing soybean, except for the northeastern part of the state. In the past, soybean was, a, from an entomology or insect pest management perspective, a pretty easy crop to grow. Farmers didn't have to worry about many pests. Only 2% of acres were scouted for pests. You know, less than 1% of acres were treated with insecticide, and that's kind of for the north central region. Um, the pests that we had were occasional, and they'd become problematic maybe when certain weather conditions lined up certain weather systems that could, could uh, blow in migratory pests or drought conditions that would make situations favorable for certain pests like spider mites. Um, you know, so we had things like, and we still have bean leaf beetles, spider mites, you know, certain caterpillar pests. But all that changed in 2000 with the arrival of the soybean aphid, which is pictured here. They're kind of cute and cuddly looking, but when you get thousands of them on a plant, they can be pretty destructive. They're feeding on the sap of the plants, removing the photosynthate, um, first showed up in 2000 in Wisconsin, rapidly spread from there within that first year. Uh, I think that's what's shown in red on that map. And then uh, the counties highlighted in yellow are the known distribution through uh, 2009. And, and it, it's here, it's here to stay. Um, not trying to be discouraging, but you know, I think we can do some work to try to decrease the frequency of outbreaks and magnitude of outbreaks though. Um, it's an invasive species, a true invasive species. It's causing problems. And then the other part of that definition is it, it's from somewhere else. This, this pest is from Asia. So China, Korea, Japan, some other parts of Southeast Asia. And here's some of the agricultural impact. You can see a heavily infested plant at the top, uninfested plant at the bottom. You know, that's thousands of aphids on a plant there. Um, the feeding causes economic damage by reducing the number of pods per plant, pod size, uh, number of seeds per plant, size of the seeds, and quality of those seeds. In addition to that, the soybean aphid can vector viruses to soybean and to other plants, um, potato, snap beans. It doesn't develop populations on these other crops, but they're flying around the landscape and kind of landing on plants, tasting them, trying to decide if, if it's something they want to establish a population on or not. And if they don't like it, then they'll go somewhere else. But that process of tasting that plant, sometimes they can, they can vector viruses to those plants. So that's a big issue in potato production in northwestern Minnesota. And there's more recent research showing that uh, soybean aphid can facilitate populations of a soil pest, the soybean cyst nematode. So you get direct impacts from the soybean aphid, but also these indirect impacts as well. So I talked about the past, you know, how growers what growers had to contend with on, on the insect end of things, and now the present, so post soybean aphid invasion. You know, we've got 77% of soybean acres being scouted. That's a 40-fold increase from the, the pre-soybean aphid scenario. 130-fold uh, increase in acres treated with insecticides. You know, so it could be 13% on average. Some states, it's 57%. Some of my recent survey work indicated 37% of the acres in Minnesota treated for soybean aphid, you know, and that resulted in an increase in production costs of, of 16 to 33 dollars per hectare. I should have converted it to uh, acres. I have a hard time thinking. Hectares. So these, these control costs plus, plus the yield losses from this past amount to more than two million dollars per year. So we've got a significant pest here. 
since its arrival in 2000, there, there's been a ton of work done at the University of Minnesota, other universities throughout the region, uh, USDA, many entities teaming up to try to figure out how we can manage this pest. And a lot of that early research focused on some of the basics of, of uh, insect pest management or the foundations for integrated pest management. So getting into the fields and scouting the fields for the pest, coming up with some kind of an estimate of the pest population. So there's somebody out there doing the kind of the hateful job of actually counting aphids on the plants. Have any of you ever scouted for Slavian aphids before? So imagine, you know, walking through waist high, sometimes chest high soybean depending on the growing season. And if it's a heavy aphid infestation, those plants are all sticky from the honeydew. So you come out, your pants are just coated with this sticky, syrupy-like substance. And then, you know, it's hot, it's humid, it's more humid within that soybean canopy. And then crouching down and counting hundreds, thousands of aphids. After you get some experience, you can, you can estimate the aphid populations without actually counting, so it speeds things up. But it's still a very uh, time-intensive uh, process. So research has been performed to figure out how many plants we need to look at within a soybean field to get a good estimate of the soybean aphid population. And then research was conducted to identify or develop an action threshold. Joe mentioned this, or an economic threshold. So this is the point at which the growers should pull the trigger on their insecticide application to protect that crop from yield loss due to this pest. So they should be in the fields counting those aphids every seven to 10 days calculating an average density per plant for that field. And once that density reaches 250 aphids per plant, that's when they should line up the insecticide application to keep that pest population from reaching what we call the economic injury level. And that's the point at which they'll start experiencing economic loss. Or in another way to put it, that's the point where that aphid infestation is going to cost enough damage to justify the additional input expenses of an insecticide application. And then if you time it right and have a, an effective insecticide, you can knock that pest population down and hopefully get through the season with just that one insecticide application. But Joel mentioned we have insecticide resistance now in the soybean aphid. We just published a paper documenting that for the first time in North America. And this year was a nightmare for farmers in northwestern Minnesota. Some growers had to spray their fields at, at least three times to protect yield. So, so not a good situation. And then, you know, coming in with, with the insecticide applications. These have been primarily pyrethroid insecticides and organophosphate insecticides, which are, which are the broad spectrum uh, products. Broad spectrum meaning not only do they kill the targeted pest insect, but they can kill a lot of other stuff too. You know, we're hearing about um, imp impacts on pollinators. There are other beneficial insects out there including insects in the fields, the predators, and tiny parasitic wasps that help suppress the aphid populations. And the growers don't want to be killing those insects. So using that threshold, they give some of these good guys a chance to keep that aphid population low. And then once they hit that threshold, you know, then it's justified to come in and use the insecticide to knock those populations down. But unfortunately, when doing that, they're going to knock down th those beneficial insects as well. Um, like I said, it could be a ground-based or an aerial application. Um, generally, one well-timed application, so using that threshold, an effective insecticide, and you can get through the season, but we're seeing that that's not always the case. You know, we're getting two, three applications required in one year. Um, some of the concerns here, I mentioned insecticide resistance. So we've got soybean aphid populations that are resistant to the pyrethroid insecticides. And remember, it was basically just two main groups of insecticides that we were using to manage soybean aphids, pyrethroids and organophosphates. We do have the neonicotinoid insecticides, but those are mainly applied to the seed, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, there are some uh, neonicotinoids that are formulated as foliar insecticides, things that can be sprayed, but they're, they're less commonly used. Uh, we have the non-target impacts, so that could be impacts to uh, the lady beetles, parasitic wasps that are working against the pests within the fields. It could be to pollinators flying through that field or in adjacent fields if there's a drift scenario. And then, you know, there's a potential for contamination of surface waters. You may recall a few years ago, the uh, MDA and Pollution Control uh, declared 
some of these insecticides as surface water contaminants of concern. Some people were linking those to soybean aphid applications. Um, you know, I'm not sure what the, the real source was, but, but there's that potential there. So we're, we've got a lot of research-based recommendations for scouting and the threshold for insecticide applications. But under the, the umbrella or the idea of integrated pest management, we don't want to rely on just one management tactic for a pest. So we do have insecticidal seed treatments. These are systemic insecticides applied to the seed. The seed are planted. The plant starts growing. So the systemic means that those insecticides are taken up into those young plants, and they can protect those plant tissues for a certain amount of time. Um, for soybean aphid, unfortunately, this is not a very effective tool for soybean aphid management unless you get early infestations of the soybean aphid. And the reason for that is depicted in this uh, diagram that we had in one of our recent extension publications where you've got time, you know, plant growth stages, soybean plant growth stages across the bottom. This red triangle represents the concentration of those insecticides within the plants. And you see that over time, that insecticide decreases or kind of peters out. So if the aphids were to show up early, you'd likely get effective control. But unfortunately, in most situations, those aphids are showing up a little bit later in the season after the concentrations within the plants have decreased to ineffective levels. So, so there are other soil pests that these insecticidal seed treatments can provide effective control of, you know, things that live in the soil or things that attack the plants early. So, so it can be an effective tool <coughs> under these high-risk high situations for some of the pests. But for soybean aphid, generally not the best management tactic. Um, we have another approach to managing pests that we call host plant resistance. So these are soybean plants that are resistant to the soybean aphids. And this is through traditional breeding. It's not genetic modification or transgenics. So there's been a ton of work done where researchers have screened or tested different soybean lines or varieties from all over the world. And fortunately, we found some of those soybean lines that just innately have resistance to this pest. And then follow-up work has identified several different genes within those plants that confer that resistance. And what we see in this graph, we've got a susceptible soybean line, a soybean line with with one of those genes, a soybean line with a different gene. Those genes are called RAG genes. The RAG stands for resistance aphis glycines, the scientific name for the soybean aphid. And then they're just numbered in the order for, for which they're um, identified. And then we've got this pyramided situation where soybean breeders have incorporated multiple resistance genes into one soybean line. We've got the economic injury level uh, indicated by this red line as, as kind of a reference point on this graph. And then the different colored bars represent different locations and years. So we see there was good aphid pressure for these experiments where the susceptible plants had very high aphid numbers. We see that the resistant plants with just a single resistance gene did a pretty good job suppressing those aphid populations. However, it's not a silver bullet. We get situations where the aphids can reach damaging levels still. But when we look at this pyramided situation, we see that, that highly effective control was offered. However, I mentioned aphids can develop resistance to insecticides. They can also outsmart us when it comes to host plant resistance too. We've got aphid populations now that are resistant to the resistant plants. Um, so there's a lot of follow-up work going on now to identify new resistance genes and combining more and more of these resistance genes into soybean lines to, to make the, the control more effective and to better um, postpone the development of the aphids resistance to the resistant plants. Unfortunately, um, there are not many varieties available within Minnesota. I tasked uh, one of my students in a postdoc with scouring all the seed catalogs for soybean, and this is all they came up with for soybean lines with resistance to the soybean aphid that are available in Minnesota. I think that's 11 different soybean lines compared to, I'm not sure where Joe is, but it's hundreds and hundreds of soybean varieties that are available you know, to, for use in Minnesota. So this is just a, a tiny fraction of them that have resistance. So, so there's definitely a need for this kind of work. And the Inva Terrestrial Invasive Species Center is funding some work in my lab and in the Soybean Breeders Lab on campus to um, develop 
well-adapted soybean varieties for Minnesota with multiple resistance genes. Another management tactic is biological control. So I mentioned some of these good insects that are out there in the soybean field, um, helping the farmers in keeping the aphid populations low. These include you know, some well-known insects like the lady beetles, lacewings, um, you get these tiny parasitic wasps. They make their living by laying their eggs into the aphids. The eggs hatch into a larva, and then that larva feeds within the aphid and kills it. And then kind of like the Aliens movie, if you remember that, the wasp will emerge and go attack another aphid. Um, the Invasive Species Center is also funding some work on campus related to biological control with these parasitic wasps for um, George Heimpel's lab. And then we've got um, different fungal diseases and viral diseases that, that can attack the aphids as well. So now getting to buckthorn, which I think is the reason you all came here today. So what is the role of buckthorn for the soybean aphid? Joe kind of alluded to the fact that, that it's, it's, it's critical in the life cycle of this pest. So let's take a quick look at this life cycle. You know, you may remember back to biology classes that you had, you know, thinking about different insect life cycles, you know, like a butterfly where you go to egg, larva, pupa, adult. This life cycle is way beyond that, way more complicated. So what you get is the pest overwinters on buckthorn as an egg, and then those eggs hatch, and you'll get a few generations of wingless females that are produced on those plants. So notice I mentioned just females. So males aren't involved at all. They're reproducing without mating. And their babies are born pregnant. So just keep that in mind. These things are reproducing machines. Um, so then after a few generations on buckthorn, they'll develop the winged generation. That'll leave the buckthorn and look for soybean. If soybean's not available, there's some indication that they might go back to buckthorn, hang out there a little longer, and then go looking for soybean. Um, on soybean, they're mainly in the non-winged form, going through multiple generations, up to 13 generations, just on, the, uh, on soybean in a year. However, if those soybean plants get too crowded with aphids, if, uh, if the quality of the plant starts decreasing for the aphids, they'll produce winged forms that'll fly out and look for healthier, uh, less, less heavily colonized plants within that field or in other fields. And then in the fall, based on you know, temperatures and photo period, the aphids will develop a winged form again that'll migrate to buckthorn. On buckthorn, you'll get mating, the only time of the year when mating occurs, and then the females will lay their eggs, and then those eggs will overwinter. So buckthorn is, is considered the primary host or the overwintering host for soybean aphid. So in Asia, um, some of the documented overwintering hosts or primary hosts for soybean aphid are Ramnus davarica and Ramnus japonica. In North America, we've got some other buckthorn species, mainly Ramnus cathartica, but there have been a few others <coughs> that have been documented as, as overwintering hosts for this pest. If you're looking at buckthorn and you find aphids, it's not a sure thing that it's soybean aphid. There are some other aphids that do occur on buckthorn. Um, however, if you find these, it's going to be very difficult to distinguish them. I've spent my career working with insects, a good chunk of it working with aphids, and I can still barely do it. You need to look under a scope, and you're essentially looking at the pattern of hairs on aphids' butts. <laughs> um, there's been some work done looking at the biology of soybean aphid on buckthorn, looking at the survivorship of eggs from fall to spring. Some research from, um, has shown you know, a 70% decrease in egg densities. Uh oh, cr crickets are chirping. I must be boring you guys. <laughs> um, natural enemies could be contributing to this. So a lot of those natural enemies that occur in the soybean fields also occur on buckthorn. And then there's some work done at the University of Minnesota prior to my time here uh, looking at certain winter temperatures that can kill soybean aphids. So, so these winter cold temperatures could also contribute to this decrease in the egg load on, on buckthorn over the winter. There's been work done looking at uh, development as a function of temperature. If you think about degree days, you know, that accumulation of heat units, not only for buckthorn, but for the aphids. And it's shown that the aphid 
development is pretty well synced up with buckthorn development with the uh, eggs hatching very near to when the, the buckthorn buds are swelling. And you know this has been shown in the laboratory and then under field conditions with, with a few different kinds of models. So now that link between buckthorn and soybean aphid populations, which I think to Joe would be kind of the, the holy grail here that, that he would be hoping for. So if we look at things from a, a large geographic scale, you know, thinking about individual states, on the x-axis we've got percent of counties with buckthorn within a state. Each of these dots is a state. And then these are data from 2003 to 2006, and that was the percent of soybean acres treated with, with foliar insecticides. Remember, most of these other pests in the north central region aren't abundant enough to trigger insecticide applications. So I think we can pretty safely assume that most of these insecticide applications are due to the soybean aphid. And we can see that, that there is a relationship there. It's a little bit sloppy, but you know, Minnesota has a lot of buckthorn, and we also had quite a few insecticide applications for soybean aphid. And there's been some more detailed research done looking at aphid abundance in association with buckthorn. Um, some work out of Ontario has found that the abundance of uh, soybean aphid to be related to buckthorn density in proximity to soybean fields. And then these bottom two bullets, they don't specifically measure buckthorn, but they use kind of indices that could indicate presence of buckthorn, so forest cover, um, you know, kind of assuming if there's forest, there's probably buckthorn there. And then this bottom one looking at some other conditions that could be favorable for buckthorn and, and then making that association that, you know, if there's these certain conditions, there's probably buckthorn there. However, one thing to keep in mind is that these wooded habitats that might have buckthorn might not only be favorable to the soybean aphid, they could be favorable to some of these good insects as well. There's been research showing that, you know, the more forest or non-crop habitat on the landscape the more natural enemies you can have, like lady beetles. So seeing data like this in the previous slide, you know, starting to look like there's a pretty good connection maybe between buckthorn abundance and soybean aphid abundance. However, things aren't always that clear cut. I thank Peter for reminding me of this paper. I had forgot about it when I was putting this, uh, this slide set together. Um, this is some work that was done by, by Dave Hogg, Dave Voltlin, um, and, and a few other folks who were very heavily involved with soybean aphid research from the time it first showed up. And they would do these huge road trips across the Midwest, sampling buckthorn, looking for the overwintering eggs, overwintering populations on buckthorn. And what they found is that throughout most of the Midwest, they could not find overwintering populations on buckthorn. However, there's a stretch along uh, the 41st um, degree latitude where, th where they would find overwintering populations on buckthorn. So this doesn't necessarily mean that, that we don't have overwintering populations in Minnesota or other states. Maybe they're out there, but since we have more buckthorn, those populations might be more diluted among all that buckthorn. So it's kind of like searching for a needle in a haystack. Um, in this paper, though, they were kind of their main conclusion is, okay, we've got these locations where we know soybean aphid populations over winter, and then they did some population genetic work on soybean aphids from soybean in Wisconsin and in Ohio, and they found that there's a pretty good likelihood that those aphids, in those two states at least, came from these different buckthorn populations. So, so it's not as clear cut that, you know, having that buckthorn right next to a field is going to be the source of the aphids for that field. Um, you know, I, I think there, there's still a lot we need to learn about this pest, its connection to buckthorn, and that those different dispersal patterns in the fall and in the spring to and from uh, buckthorn. So just a few concluding uh, statements here. Soybean aphid is still the most significant insect pest that we're dealing with in soybean in Minnesota and the other north central states. Right now, it's foliar insecticides that we're relying on primarily for soybean aphid management. However, there is a lot of work going on to develop some of these other management tactics, uh, like aphid-resistant soybean, biological control. Buckthorn is a necessary component of the, uh, of the life cycle 
of this pest. But as you saw, that, that connection isn't as simple as, as we hoped it would be. And I think the big question that, that we can all be thinking about is can buckthorn be manipulated to affect soybean aphid abundance? And the Minnesota Soybean Grower Association is funding um, a project being led by a professor from the forestry department to start looking into this. You know, in Minnesota, do we see an association between buckthorn abundance and soybean aphid abundance? And then I think some of the next steps would be to look to see if, you know, can we manipulate that buckthorn and see changes in the, uh, the soybean aphid infestations. So with that, I'll wrap it up. If I didn't go over my time, um, I can try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Question. Do you know what the, the dispersal ranges of those aphids are if they're seeing the populations in Wisconsin coming from Ohio? You know how far they travel? Yeah, so the question is, you know, how far can the aphids travel? And there's been some work done, you know, where they, they tie aphids to what we call flight mills. It's basically they tether them to this little machine and they make them fly in circles. And then knowing that distance and how many revolutions they've made, they can calculate how far they've flown. Um, I don't remember the exact distance, but I mean, I think it's the order of miles. Um, however, with aphids and a lot of other insects, they can get up into the low level jet streams and be blown around, kind of like aerial plankton. You know, so, so there's been research shown where, where you do get this interstate movement, large scale interstate movement of aphids. So complicating matters even more. Yeah. Question in the back? Yeah, oh. I, had, I was wondering, uh, what is the projection for that 41st uh, uh, latitude to, with climate change to maybe migrate north here, that we'd have those same conditions and be more conducive then to the aphid overwintering? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm not the person to provide a, a very good response to that, but Lee, I wonder if, if you might with, be able to provide an answer to that. Two to three degrees shift in latitude over how much time? End of the century. By the end of the century. Was there another question behind that, gentlemen? No? No, okay. no the first one answered. Thank you. I think there's a hand over here first, right behind you. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little confused about that four kilometer figure. If a farmer, say, was able to eliminate all the buckthorn within four kilometers of the field, would that then generally prevent the aphids from coming in? So you're referring to that, that one of the last slides I showed or just summarizing these different studies that have looked at these landscape level variables and they found that there's an association between soybean aphid abundance in the fields and how much buckthorn there was within a four kilometer radius. Um, we're not there yet where we can make that kind of statement where if a farmer could get rid of all that buckthorn within four kilometers, they wouldn't have issues in their soybean field. And I think the challenge of that is these aphids are very mobile, you know, so, so in my response to the question from the front here, you know, that they can move between states even. Um, the, the data from Wisconsin and Ohio was suggesting those populations are coming from these, these uh, points along the 41st latitude. So, so it's tough. You know, that side, because of those reasons, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to think that there could be much success there but nobody's tested it yet, you know? So I think, I think with the support of, of Minnesota Soybean and, and some of the work going on in the forestry department, it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if, if that project can keep going to start trying to manipulate buckthorn near fields to see if, if it'll result in any change in the pressure. Question here. So just to follow up on that a little bit, just for clarity. Just to follow up on that a little bit and to clarify a little bit more if I can infer this based both on the fact that there's a potential for long-range transport and the fact that we see very high infestations of soybean aphids in places that have low densities of buckthorn, southwest Minnesota, northwest Minnesota, would it be fair to hypothesize at this point that we would, it would require very significant reductions in density over a large area to result in a soybean aphid reduction? And we're going to have to do right. a little bit of control isn't going to be enough. It's going to be a lot. Again, there, there are 
I'm not aware of any research that specifically looked at that or kind of modeled those different scenarios, but that's kind of my gut feeling going into it, just because of that, that mobility of this pest. Um, and we're seeing, I mean, southwest corner of the state doesn't have high buckthorn densities, and the aphid infestations are Right, but well, I mean, you still severe. have tree lines and stuff. And but, but I'm valleys. saying, if we tried to reduce yeah. to that level across the rest of the state, that's a very significant reduction. Thank you very much, Bob. It was a great talk. And if folks have more questions, I'm sure you can catch up with him later. If we manage to squeeze a, a break in, which I'm not sure we will, but otherwise at the end of the session.